Well, what I did was I just uh, put together some highlights uh, from last month instead of going through every single uh, release and, and, you know, uh, and nitpicking through the vinegar syndromes and the flicker alleys and all that. We, I thought, would just hit some of the highlights. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that because some of those titles are pretty good, but... Uh, Anyway, uh, and then we'll just we'll pretty much go through the Februarys for the most part, um, you know, as well. But uh, we we can start with early January because there's been a lot of stuff that's come along the pike, come down the pike. I've gotten quite a few. It's kind of hard to keep up with it there for a little while. Uh, I think I'm starting to get it down to a manageable bunch. <laughs> but anyway. But uh, there was, uh, starting at early January, we had a 20th anniversary edition of Jerry Maguire. Can you imagine? It's hard to believe. Yeah. 20 years. Oh, yeah. Man. And uh, this is a limited edition. It has, uh, um, I think, approximately two hours of new stuff, new content. There's, I uh, think, about 45 minutes of new deleted scenes that have never been seen before. So if you're a fan of Jerry wow. Maguire, there's, it's worth the upgrade. Uh, and like I said, it is a limited edition, uh, so it's not going to be out there indefinitely. Uh, I cannot imagine myself ever watching Jerry Maguire ever again. <laughs> <laughs> really? I remember just... you not being a fan, yeah. I mean, it was okay the first time around, but you know, yeah. that once is enough for that movie. <laughs> I don't know. It hit a soft spot with me. Uh, I have to admit, it really did, and uh, I, I went for it. And I've enjoyed it on subsequent viewings. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> and I always wondered, you know, what it would have been like. You know, the old man that uh, that has those little, you know, when they cut away to him for a second, where he gives those yeah. pieces of advice. You know, that was originally supposed to be uh, Billy Wilder playing that part, the director Billy Wilder, and. Cameron Crowe wanted him to do that, and he could not convince him to uh, to to do uh, that to, to do that part because he just didn't want to be on camera and acting. And that was and that was kind of the uh, what led to him doing that coffee table book of interviews with uh, Billy Wilder, which is phenomenal for anybody that hasn't read it. It's called Conversations with Billy Wilder and uh, conducted by Cameron Crowe. And it's just if you haven't read it and you're a serious film a fan of film get it uh but yeah. anyway but yeah i just wonder what that would have been like had he convinced him to do that <laughs> so, well i think that uh, who, whoever he got uh seems like a real business guy i mean like an mm-hmm. old, older business guy right so, i right. mean he seems like an authentic regular person um I don't know who it is. It could be a professional actor that's been in the business for decades. I'm not sure, but I think he really did work for that uh, that particular person that they chose. Billy yeah, Wilder, so. you know, might have felt a little bit different. Plus, Bill, 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 Billy Wilder has that. Didn't he have that uh, accent? Didn't he have yeah, he did. Accent? A little bit of an accent. Yeah. Everything's yeah. like Z, Z, Z. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> he always amazed me. His command of of the English language and his ability to just pick up on the nuances of it, in spite of the fact that he was German. It's just, it, yeah. it's just when you think about it, it, and you go back and watch his films. I and and one of the releases that we'll talk about later is uh, Love in the Afternoon, which is one of his from '57, and I, I just rewatched that uh, the review copy they sent me, and it, it's still great, holds up, and. And it's you're watching it, and it's like I can't believe this guy was 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 a German immigrant. Mm. <laughs> the, the I wonder. Of, so I wonder because he always wrote with a co-writer. You know, I mean, there's, he did. there's usually yeah. a co-writer, and I wonder if some of the co-writers uh, uh, helped him with that. That's uh, true, but he was so good with a quip. I mean, even just off the cuff. You know, so and there are all these stories that linger about with him. Uh, you know, like when they were sitting at the funeral for um, the guy who was uh, his last name was Cohn. What was his name? I can't think of his name. He was the head Harry of Columbia Cone. Pictures. Yeah, Harry, Harry Cohn. That's it. Yeah, Harry Cohn. Yeah, they were having his funeral, 
and Billy Wilder was sitting there, and, and, every, and he was universally hated by everybody in Hollywood, supposedly Harry Cohn was. And, and they're sitting there, and Billy Wilder's you know, on the front row or whatever, and he didn't much care for him either. I guess he was there out of respect. And somebody said, boy, this place is packed, and uh, this funeral for Harry Cohn. And he said, well, give the people what they want. <laughs> 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 that was the kind of thing you could just pull stuff like that out of thin air, you know. He was just like he was great at that kind of thing. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway. well, yeah. let me ask you this because uh, mm-hmm. this is another topic. But uh, well, we got a lot of time because we only have two months to review. Uh, <laughs> the uh, you know I was thinking about seeing Billy Wilder's gravesite and and you did too Adam because you you I went to the same yeah. cemetery I did well one of the other gravesites I I saw was Sharon Tate and then I read that uh, Polanski's trying to get back to the US so he could visit Sharon Tate's gravesite wow um and a judge is going to rule on it uh, next Friday or this coming oh, Friday mm. that's interesting yeah. Or, or I, by I, the time by the time people listen to this episode today, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's. I went there too. I, I visited her grave too, and it's uh, it's it's not far from it's close, close proximity to Bella Lugosi, which was kind of odd. I thought. Yeah. <laughs> and being yeah, crossed, beautiful too. spot. It is. Yeah. yeah. Yes. It sure was. Well, okay, that's interesting. Ahead. I didn't I hadn't heard about that, but. Anyway, um, well, anyway, go back to 1981 for this next one. Uh, Last flight of Noah's Ark. <laughs> How about that one? One of those Disney wow. films. Wow. <laughs> That's like a. Then, it's like a it's like a kids movie, right? And it's, it's like a it's like a big balloon or something. Uh, it's like an action adventure, I, I think. Uh, it's like a plane, uh, from okay. what I remember. That Noah's Ark is like an actual is an airplane or something. I just remember seeing the trailers for this on TV when I was a kid, but I never actually saw the movie. Yeah, I've never seen and, it. And uh, never did. But believe it or not, Disney is actually putting this out, which is kind of interesting that they have enough faith in that title. To issue it instead of farming it out. So again, yeah. well, I mean, they've probably already done Condor Man, right? So uh, no, they have not actually. They haven't done that Condor is... Man. Well, that can't no, be far that... behind. And same thing with Devil and Max Devlin, even though it has Bill Cosby in it. That's the <laughs> Devil, by the way. <laughs> wow, that movie. That movie always put me to sleep. <laughs> which one? I, uh, which one? The one with Bill Cosby. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. Oh, oh boy, funny. that's great. Okay. <laughs> that is great. Yeah, he. Uh, yeah, but I, I, I think they may have put out uh, Devil and Max Devlin already. I, I'm not sure about that, but yeah, the, they were churning out some interesting live action films in the late '70s, early '80s. You know, when uh, this was in in the immediate wake of uh, the Black Hole. Yeah, you know, after it came out, and uh, so they, you know, they did their, they had their slapstick comedy phase, and then they started doing these live action adventure sci fi movies, and it was kind of a weird time for for Disney, I think. It definitely was. They were, they were. It's hard to believe, but they Disney was really uh, failing in yes. the, in the seventies and the eight and the early eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they were. It, it's it's you know it's hard to believe that they came out with a movie like <clears throat> the Black Cauldron or something like that, like an animated movie <laughs> that just tanked, that, that died at the box office, and yeah, um, to the point where some animators like Don Bluth, you know, left the uh, left Disney because they didn't mm-hmm. feel like they were really. Uh, cleaving to the brief that they had once had about, uh, you know, giving the highest quality entertainment to the people. And uh, and then, of course, Don Bluth went on to do things like Land Before Time and and uh, Secret of Nim. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know where he is now. I, well, he must still be doing animation if he's still around. But, um, uh, but here's, yeah, a, here's a trivia weird. for you. Here's a trivia for you. Barry Manilow scored a Don Bluth film. Which one? 
Mm, that's uh, an yeah, American Th- Tale too. I was going to say, is it Thumbelina? Yep, uh, it's Thumbelina. Thumbelina. Wow, I can't um, believe I knew that. <laughs> but the uh, you know it is interesting though. I mean, if you think of how movies kind of changed on into the late sixties, seventies, you know, oh, where yeah. does Disney and where where did family entertainment fall into that? Because that wasn't really the course du jour back. Back in those days. No. Yeah. yeah, those films were really anachronistic, you know, in the early 70s. And they kept trying to do it like... Good word. Well, Good they word, did too. Adam. What's that? <laughs> anachronistic. <laughs> Good word. Anach- oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. thanks. Appreciate that. Anachronistic. Uh, yeah. 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 But, it, but, but they were, you know, th- I'm thinking of things like The Happiest Millionaire, which was a colossal bomb, you know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and nearly unwatchable, and, right? And it and it just feels so out of place uh, when you think that it was released alongside The Graduate and the same time frame as The Graduate and Bonnie and Clyde, and then here comes Disney with The Happiest Millionaire. <laughs> like, yeah, what? I mean, yeah, all those things like Super Dad, uh, right, Bob yeah. Crane, and uh, the Boat Nicks with uh, uh, Robert Morse and. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was it? No deposit, no return, with right, David Niven yeah, yeah. and a whole bunch of people in that. I guess their one of their biggest hits during that period was probably the Apple Dumpling Gang, which uh, uh, with uh, Tim Conway and Don Knotts mm-hmm. kind of launched yeah. a kind of mini, uh, <clears throat> mini branch of a career for them, uh, for those two guys yeah. as, as comedy as a comedy duo, but. Um, but yeah, very weird. Yeah, very it's weird uh, it, part odd of that. time. Yeah. And they did Walker do well in the Woods. Was that another one? Uh, that's another one. Yeah, eighty one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and something wicked this way comes, which is a really good one. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah. And uh, but they did do well with the Love Bug. I remember that grossed a lot of money in sixty nine. So that was mm-hmm. like one of the top mm-hmm. five grossing films that year. So so yeah. they did. Did they, they do? Did have, they do the? Did they do the Benji movies? No, no that, that was wasn't an independent. Them. That was Joe yeah. Camp. He was an in, indie. Right. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, did they, they do, did all those uh, Kurt Russell movies like uh, Now You See Him, Now You Don't, and the uh, the computer who wore tennis shoes and. Uh, <laughs> Million Dollar uh, Duck. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that wasn't one of the Kurt Russells, but yeah, Million Dollar Duck. No, that's true. He was and uh, that darn cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could uh, Shaggy D A. You could go on and on. The str- uh, yeah. uh, the world's the world is uh, the world's. Uh, what was that thing? World's with, greatest athlete. The world's greatest athlete with Jen Michael Vincent. Right. And also the strongest man in the world. That was the uh, uh, that yeah. was another Kurt Russell. Yeah, you know it's <laughs> funny. You were talking about uh, Super Dad a while ago. Uh, you remember in uh, Autofocus, you know the uh, Paul Schrader movie about uh, Bob Crane. <laughs> yeah. They you have know, a the, moment where they're re- reproducing right. Super Dad. <laughs> That's right. That's what I was thinking about. Because they have that crazy, you know, rear projection footage, yeah. and you know uh, they've got like. Uh, um, Greg Kinnear reacting to that <laughs> stock yeah. footage behind him. <laughs> yeah, he's like uh, he's supposed to, he's supposed to be like um, he's supposed to be skiing behind a boat or something like right, that. Right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh god, that stuff's so funny. All right, all it right, is. moving but, on. Okay, moving along. Yeah. So, uh, how about the Inner Scene Project with James Coburn, which I have never seen, but uh, I think Keenan put that one out. <laughs> I didn't yeah. think that one either. Uh, Whoa. Who 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 did that one? Who put that one out? Uh Kino put that out. It's James Coburn and I remember it used to play on, you know, local T V when I was a kid, but you know, these independent stations that were running like late at night, but I never never caught up with it, never did, but Such uh, an odd uh, title. Mm-hmm. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> The, well, how about the 1987 the, film uh, Dead of Winter? That's one we probably all know. Yeah, that's a pretty dour Harry, movie. Harry Steenburgen. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. And and Arthur Penn, right? It's an that's Arthur right. Penn. That's right. <laughs> Boy. 
Oh, boy. I guess it's, you know, it's just, you know, it's inevitable that uh, no matter how great you are, you're going to sink to the level of dead of winter. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, you know, that's a Scream Factory release, and they've been doing, they've got the MGM UA catalog, so they're plumbing through that. Uh, the uh, their their catalog and putting out a lot of these uh, things. So that's um, I think it's a two disc. They did a really bang up job on it for people who mm. are fans. So. Uh, so Criterion released His Girl Friday, which is uh, uh, definitely one of the better releases of January because it's a new 4K restoration. Looks great. Never looked as good as it does. But this and uh, in the same package, which is a pretty good deal here. They also contain um, it. Also contains a separate disc with the front page, the original film that this was a remake of, and it's a new uh, UK cut of um, the front page that was recently discovered. So it's a uh, has a little bit more footage and slightly different, but it's it's supposedly a preferred version of it. So so you get kind of get two movies for the price of one with this package, but. Uh, it's uh, mm. his girl Friday is. I mean, you know, what can you say about it? It's still funny and um, in in the way of those Howard Hawks comedies, you know. So it, it holds up and looks great. So Rotham Russell is fantastic in it. Uh, in oh yeah, pretty... probably the best thing she ever did. I yeah, think. yeah. I would. Uh, I would. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Auntie Mame, but uh, um, yeah. But yeah, I, I really like. Uh, I really love her in that movie. I mean, Grant. Yeah. And, it's, it's Ralph Bellamy, right, in it? Yeah, Ralph Bellamy. There's a great scene in it, and I guess this was ahead of its time when, uh, you know, there, she's engaged to Ralph Bellamy but is divorced from Cary Grant in the movie. And and so he's trying to describe what her fiancé looks like to somebody. He says, what does he look like? Well, he's he's about this tall. And he says, well, he looks kind of like that actor, Ralph Bellamy, you know. <laughs> looks, you know that's, like, that's way ahead of its time for it is. You know, the to be that sort of meta, breaking of the fourth wall, right? In, yeah. in a way, yeah, that's that, great. Yeah, and supposedly that line was improvised by Cary Grant on the set, so it goes. Wow. Um, but, huh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, pretty pretty witty stuff, and um, almost requires multiple viewings, you know, because of the rat a tat tat dialogue and all yeah. that. Uh, but uh, it has you know lots of great uh, extra features and documentaries and such. So so that's one that uh, I would recommend. Also, Scavenger Hunt. How about this one from 1979? <laughs> Anybody remember that one? Well, that's one of those what I call chaos movies, like uh, you know, like um, you know, Mad Mad World and so forth. Yes, of right? course. Uh, yes, and uh, Million Dollar Mystery. <laughs> <laughs> and million dollar mystery, which I tried to uh, tried to watch and, and couldn't get through, uh, and was shocked to find that uh, it was photographed by Jack Cardiff, which <laughs> like, oh my god, <laughs> not Jack Cardiff, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, what's the, what's the, okay? So I've got the cast here. <laughs> This cast is so funny. Oh my god. Richard Benjamin, James Coco, Scatman Crothers, Ruth Gordon, Cloris Leachman, yep. Cleavon Little, yep. Roddy McDowell, Robert yep. Morley, Richard Mulligan, Tony Randall, Willie Ames, yep. Stephen <laughs> First and Richard Mazer. <laughs> oh, and Arnold Schwarzenegger's in it too, by the way. Really? Yes, and Vincent. I think you mentioned Vincent Price. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's it Meat actually it, yeah, Meatloaf <laughs> too. Yeah, it's actually pretty. It's it's kind of funny actually. I I'd never seen it. Always wanted to, and uh, got you know and put it on and and checked it out for the first time ever. And I it's very slapsticky, you know. But uh, it's it and I'll tell you, it's it's. Probably on a par with it's a mad, 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 mad world. Actually, I would think, <laughs> it's, uh, which is a movie that you either love or hate, really. It's, it's, and this is one of those. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's about as funny, I would say. And some people might say that's blasphemy to say that, but uh, that's <laughs> but it's it is. I mean, it's you know, it's it's a, it's same kind of humor. You know, very manic, very. Uh. 
you know. Well, I have to say that cast is hilarious. I've got I I, I kind of want to watch it just to see all those people in it. It is worth seeing if you if you appreciate you know seeing that the diversity of that cast for mm. sure. And uh, film and filmed like, by filmed by James James Cardiff. <laughs> no, no, no. James Cardiff did not do the cinematography on this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is well, well, this is actually directed by the guy who made Car Wash. What's his name? Michael um Michael Schultz. Name. Yeah. Michael Schultz, yeah. And uh yeah, he does a commentary on the Blu ray, believe it or not. They brought him out for that. And uh have Richard Benjamin is an extra on there too. He does a little piece on it and talks about it. But uh anyway, yeah, I'd so really like scavenger to, hunt. I'd really like to see I'd really like to see a a truly great cinematographer do like a really awful movie like on purpose to see if photography can make actually the content of the movie better um, but, you know I don't think it works that way <laughs> yeah. well I, I, mean, I, mean, I, I, under, I, I understand right. logically but I mean uh, it would be a neat experiment if you got a world class cinematographer and people walked out of a movie that they otherwise would think was terrible and they'd think Oh God, that was that was great, just by the nature of the visual expression in it. <laughs> <clears throat> well, it's funny, you know, because, you, you you bring up something interesting. You know, you don't see great photography in comedies very often. I mean, outside Woody of Allen, it's about it, it yeah. <clears throat> well, there's Woody Allen movies, and then of course there's the occasional Coen Brothers movie that's a raucous comedy like Big Lebowski or something like that. That mm-hmm. uh, that has you know somebody like Roger Deakins photographing it, but otherwise it's it's just not something that you see very often. Uh, I just don't know. So so if 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 James Wong Howe had shot uh, uh, Friday the Thirteenth, Jason Takes Manhattan, would it be a better movie? <laughs> You know, I think it probably it probably would be uh, because I mean the the cinematographer has you know uh, a lot of power over uh, over a film. Uh, yeah, it's true. So um, uh, that's all I'm saying. That's what I want to yeah. see. I want to see a truly first rate cinematographer film a piece of shit like a, a Friday the 13th part 11 or something. Well, go, go <laughs> and, and wanna, take a I look wanna... at Million Dollar Mystery and then we'll talk again. Because, yeah. okay. you know, Jack Cardiff is the guy that, you know, photographed all of those uh, great, you know, Powell and Pressburger movies. And, uh, oh, I know, yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, those, those are his main claim to fame. You know, things like Red Shoes and Black Narcissus. But uh, also... Also, things like the Vikings and uh, and um, uh, you know uh, he, uh, Sons and Lovers and uh, you know he's been doing movies forever. There's even a, doc- a documentary about him out there. Uh, yeah. But uh, I want to I, I want to see Roger Deakins shoot a Porky's movie. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I want to test this out, man. <laughs> Right. I'm going to do some research on this, and I'm going to yeah. try and come back to you with uh, top ten bad, bad movies photographed by great photographers. There you I would, go. That's the list Good I would idea. love to see. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, well, you know, Jan de Bont was a uh, director of photography, and he wound up doing Speed. You know, so I, you know, yeah. I don't know. Well, I no, I mean, that that photographers any... can go on to, to do. Good movies, direct good movies. Yeah, and this is kind of a different. I mean, he he wasn't on okay. the level of a, you know, he, he, he wasn't yeah, a great no, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's yeah. right. True, true. All right. Well, how about Stanley and Iris, directed by Martin Ritt, the final film for Martin Ritt from 1990. Uh, he actually yeah. died the same year this came out, uh, and I had never seen it until got the Blu-ray, and I thought it was not bad, actually. It, <laughs> yeah, not bad. It's, it's pleasant. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, it kind of got a bad rep, you know, when it came out, and uh, I 
but I I thought this this isn't bad at all actually. I it's really one of those why. movies There's, that they kind of dumped into February, like during Oscar season, if I remember correctly. That's right. And that's right. And kinda, You're right. Uh, they kind of I don't know. They they just dismissed it completely. But uh, yeah, I, I I mean it's not a great movie, but um, no. No. But I, I I really respect those two lead performances from uh, Bond and De Niro, mm-hmm. and uh, it's got a it's, it's got a nice it's got a nice little uh, it's got a nice little John Williams piano score, and and yes, I always does, remember yes. a conversation um, conversation that De Niro has with a little boy under a tree or something, and you know they both their their fathers are both gone or something. A little boy says, "When I got scared tonight, my father used to turn on the light and." And De Niro says, "My father was the light." There's a, some conversation oh, yeah, like that that right. happens. I, yeah, I always remember that conversation. That mm-hmm. has stuck with me, and I don't, I don't quite yeah. know why. But yeah, it has some good things going for it. And, and he died, I think, in December of that year. Martin Ritt did, but uh, you know, it was written by his usual collaborators. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I'd say uh, it's worth a look, worth a peek. And yeah, that was a so same, time it's, so it's, it's written by the same people who wrote HUD, and uh, that's right. That's and right. Um, all, you know, all of his best movies. That's um, true. Yep. Norma Ray as well, I think. And now, yeah. and now, uh, I wonder if Ben Carson's favorite movie is HUD. I wonder how that's how he got uh, in charge of. The <laughs> that's the, <laughs> that's the only development. way it could have happened. <laughs> that's my that's my <laughs> qualification. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, that was a Twilight Time uh, release, as as is the next title, which is a great film. I think we can all agree on this. Two for the Road from Stanley Donan from mm-hmm. 1967. Yes, I, I would and, I would say that's Audrey Hepburn's greatest performance. Mm-hmm. I'm with uh, you on that. I mean, uh, you know, uh. It's and uh, and close to the greatest performance by Albert Finney. Um, yes, yes. A, a really good screenplay. Uh, yes, and uh, and an excellent sort of time capsule of that period. Um, uh, it, it's good. You know, Stanley Donan was really doing some great things when he was over in Britain. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, to come out with this. And I guess bedazzled was that in the was that the same year or almost? I think the same so. Year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's an extraordinary year to have two movies like that, mm-hmm. and especially for that director who uh, you would think would might have been stuck in the musicals in the in the in the mm-hmm. realm of the studio musicals and comedies and so forth, but uh, but he really branched out in a in a uh, incredibly unique way. Yeah, he but might it's, have, it's he might have movie. recognized that he might have recognized that those were on their way out. Yeah, you know, he might have had the for, the foresight. One of the yeah, few you, in Hollywood to to have that. <laughs> so. Yeah, and you talk about scores now. That is a great score. Two for the road by Henry Mancini. Yeah, uh, I got it. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah, it is. Well, it's <laughs> worth it. I'm telling you, I, I have it too, of course, and it's. it's and I love the cinematography by Christopher Chalice. I, I can't mention that title without mentioning that. And the title sequence is just uh, extraordinary um, for Two for the Road. The, it was, uh, I know Dean's always talking about the fact that we don't have title sequences anymore. And when you see this right from the beginning, it just grabs you and it reminds you of how innovative title sequences used to be but aren't anymore. Yeah. I mean, he did. Yeah. They were great title sequences. I, that's pro- I think that was probably done by Maurice Bender, but um, I believe did, it was. You're right. Who did all of the um, uh, James Bond? You know, the stuff, James yeah. Bond of uh, the classic James Bond mm-hmm. uh, openings. But uh, he right. also did openings for uh, Charade, and uh, for yeah. uh, which was another Donan, and for uh, Bedazzled. So. Um, Right. So they all of those have uh, very interesting openings. Yeah. Yeah, just just a beautiful movie all the way around and uh it's it's just uh pick it up if you haven't uh, if you have it. it's 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 worth a blind buy, I'd say even if you've never seen it, if you really appreciate great films. Uh also, uh, Warner Archive did Bad Day at Black Rock. Uh Which I watched the other night. 
I watched. Yeah, it. I saw it about ten years ago, but I haven't seen it since then. So, what? Uh, you know, it's a good movie. Okay, I like it. It's real short too. It's like only eighty minutes yeah. long, and and it's got a really great look to it. It's very cinemascope mm-hmm. look, you know. Right. Uh, and uh, you know, it's uh, Spencer Tracy arriving in this town, and everybody hates him, mm-hmm. and you can't figure out mm-hmm. why. And I'm and this town's in the middle, literally in the middle of nowhere. Like apparently the train hasn't stopped there in like five years, when the movie starts. And uh, and I'm like, okay, what are these people doing out here? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, at first, at first, all you see is like all the mean guys. Like you see, you know, Robert Ryan and mm-hmm. and uh, Ernest Borgnine and and uh, Lee Marvin. They're all sitting around snarling. And, uh, and you know, Walter Brennan's like, hey, you know, he's like over in the corner, <laughs> hey, what's going on here, or whatever. But, uh, okay, so you, that's all. But at the end of the movie, there's this very quick shot of, like, I guess, uh, you know, Spencer Tracy's leaving the town. And there's this very quick shot, and you see all these other people, you know, like women in dresses and stuff, like, coming out. I'm like, you know, they're watching him leave or whatever. Like, where were all these people before, and what are they doing in this town? Where do they live? <laughs> this yeah, town doesn't right, look like right. it can halt this many people. What do they, how do they get food? What, do they go out scourging in the desert for food? <laughs> I just, you know, the, the the logic of the movie just escapes me. Yeah. Uh, but, I agree. But I like I looking at it. So. Yeah, it's a good-looking movie, but I was kind of underwhelmed. That was my take on it when I originally <laughs> Saw it, I you know it was, uh, but uh, you were talking. We were talking about Two for the Road uh, and Audrey Hepburn, nineteen sixty-seven. But her other nineteen sixty-seven film has also been issued by Warner Archives, and that would be Wait Until Dark. Now that's um, the one she got the Oscar nomination for that year. Yeah, of, yeah. Which is kind of a crime, really. I mean, <laughs> you know, I I like Wait Until Dark mainly for. Uh, I mean, she's good in it. But I love I love Alan Arkin in it. Oh he's, yeah, he's terrific. that was the that was the one uh, that was because I had like two two dream plays that I wanted to do uh, Cuckoo which Cuckoo's Nest which I was able to do, but the other one was Wait mm-hmm. Until Dark. I always wanted to do Wait Until Dark, <clears throat> and I was never <clears throat> able to. I couldn't convince anybody to do it, but uh, man, I did see a production of it, and uh, my God. It, it, it it the play is exactly like the screenplay. Mm. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if, if I mean the play of Cuckoo was written before the movie from the book. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if the play was the play written after the movie or did it come from the movie or, it or no, came, did the movie? Come then? But, it was wait, before. Are you talking, you're talking about Cuckoo now. No, Cuckoo Wait. was written before the movie, but I'm not sure if Wait Until Dark was written before the movie. I think it was. It was. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was. Okay. Yeah, because it was on I Broadway a, because, in the mid '60s, I'd say. Right. Be- because they're I have a close they're exactly the same. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't surprise yes. me because it's a very. That's one of the problems with the movie. I think is that it's stagey. Although, it finds it finds some kind of um, cinematic quality in those scenes with Arkin because it plays with the darkness mm-hmm. and and. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. They, I think they got some inspiration from his from his performance, really, frankly. Yeah. But uh, you know where it gets really dull is when Richard Crenna comes in, and just, <laughs> uh, you know you're just like, oh, come on, can we move this along, Richard Crenna, please? And uh, yeah, and, 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 and it's a Blake just, Edwards movie, uh, yeah. which is another <laughs> big surprise to see that come from Blake Edwards. But the um, uh, but the uh, uh, they did a play version of it if you remember you know probably yeah. close to 20 years ago in London and it was Marissa Tomei and Quentin Tarantino Quentin. right yeah. I have to admit uh, that would have been interesting to see yeah. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there to watch that because you know I can well, see Tarantino in that part to tell you the truth it's you know right. it's, 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 very, it's very good casting on both parts um, still, I, I'm wondering throughout the entire movie, you know, she should just give him the doll. I, I don't understand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. 
Just give me the doll. Like, what the hell? Why are you holding on? It's dumb. I get so frustrated yeah. with that film. Uh, yeah, it was uh, directed by Terrence Young, and while we're on Terrence Young, we'll tie this into another title. He also direct, well, he directed, obviously, oh, some Blake the early, Edward, uh, Hang on, hang on. Blake Edwards yeah. didn't direct Wait Until Dark. No, no, oh, I missed that. I missed it. You said, oh, okay, I missed you even said, you said that. <laughs> Why do I always think he did He did Breakfast at Tiffany's? Right. right, the same, right. Number yeah, yeah, words, yeah. same number of words as Wait Until Dark. That's why I always get those confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good, Crazy. very good. No, so, I was just tying it into another title that Terrence Young directed, which is The Klansman from 1974. So uh, uh, that was another r- release. <laughs> vomit. <laughs> Terrible. How about this cast? Richard Burton, uh, O.J. Simpson, and uh, oh, who Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin, yeah, what a cast. <laughs> Man, Origi- it was uh, Sam Fuller was the original director, and then he uh, was quit or fired, but he he retains the screenplay credit. And uh, Terrence Young, who directed Wait Until Dark, uh, stepped in and directed it. So, but all the films has put that one out. So I just wanted to get that one out of the way while we were talking about Terrence Young and Yuck. Wait Until Dark. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <Yeah>, so, <laughs> um, so. How about the triplets of Belleville? I, that's good. That's that's a, that's yeah. a very good film. Beautiful yeah, score, good. beautiful look to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm I'm interested in anything that uh, what's his name Sylvain Chaumet, uh mm-hmm. is is the French director. Right. Uh, I guess he comes out with a movie like every five years or so. Uh, right. Right. So it's. It's been a little while since his last one, so um, uh, so we should mm-hmm. expect something else. But I, I liked uh, uh, what was the last one, The Illusionist? Was that it? I believe so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's where. Uh, but uh, I, I like Trippets with Belleville quite a bit. Yeah. And Sony put that one out, and uh, and then how about uh, speaking of mid '80s films, Band of the Hand. Anybody remember <laughs> that one? Oh. <laughs> I've got uh, I've got that soundtrack <laughs> produced <laughs> produced by Michael Mann. Yes, it yep. was. Yeah, Mill Creek uh, has put that one out. It, it's a it's very uh, it's a very eighties uh, Miami Vice inspired kind of movie. Yep. yep. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. I'm sure, I I I think I can still remember the poster that has all those blues and pinks on it. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know that shade of blue was, and you know, that shade was, of pink was, that were big. <laughs> back then. It was ta- it was tailor made for like eighties kind of Cinemaxy kind of mm-hmm. uh, prime time stuff. You know, it's yeah one of those basic. It's one of those cable staples back in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was it was uh, quite frequently turned up. That's for sure. Directed um, by Paul Michael Glazer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a couple other '80s uh, staples. Uh, very wow, quickly. Wow, I didn't know this. Hold on a minute. Okay. I have to stop you with no, this. Band, go ahead. band in the hand, band of the hand. I didn't yeah. realize that uh, Hedwig himself, John Cameron Mitchell, is in it. Oh, that I didn't remember. <laughs> Stephen Lang and Lauren, or Lauren Holly. Stephen Lang. <laughs> <laughs> but. But John Cameron Mitchell, I, I, that really surprises wow. me. He must be like ridiculously young. Lawrence Fishburne and James Remar. Yeah. Wow, that is a cast. Wow. <laughs> I can't remember all that either. Yeah. Back, mm. back when I interviewed Stephen Lang, uh, I should I should have told him, look, I love your performance in Band of the Hand, and uh, that's the message I have from me to you, from me. <laughs> To you. <laughs> you remember that line yeah. and what it's from? Hmm. No. Sounds familiar. Oh, come on. The Hard Way. Oh, I've never seen that. I didn't oh. either, actually. He, I have to admit. And he, he he keeps rewinding the news clip, but it's like James Woods or, or him. I forget which character, but it's constantly from me to you. Yeah, it's James Woods. 
from me to you, from me to you, and he keeps rewinding it and playing it over and over again. Stephen Lang, <laughs> such a killer. <laughs> I, I, yeah, it's a movie. Uh, it's a movie filled with cliches, but it's a fun movie. Like James Woods and mm-hmm. Michael J. Fox. I can't believe you haven't seen it, Adam. No, I didn't. I remember when it came out, and uh, I, I really don't know why I didn't, because it was. Uh, I can remember very clearly when it came out, but I just didn't for some reason. Never, never did. I think that, is it, what is it, Woody Harrelson? No, Michael J. Fox. Michael, Michael J. Fox, Fox, yeah. That's why I didn't go see it, because I had just sworn off all Michael J. Fox by by that point. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a fun J. movie. Fox. The, the, Woody, the Woody Harrelson one is the cowboy way. Uh, the cowboy, cowboy way. way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I skipped that one, too. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> Cowboy oh, Ways actually okay. Kiefer Sutherland and uh is is Woody Harrelson the other guy? I can't remember. Mm, I don't so. remember. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, well speaking of eighties movies, we'll we'll go ahead and get a couple of these out too. How about Poltergeist two and three released in separate special editions by Scream Factory? Double How many times they gonna release these things? <laughs> these are two disc editions too. Both of these are two discs. Special editions. Two but, discs? Uh, What's on the other disc? All kinds of new interviews. Like the, Is there any footage three, of they... Heather O'Rourke's funeral in it? Uh, <laughs> I think it's... <laughs> or, or, uh, yeah, the, um, yeah. The, or some of the other... What's on the other disc is the... the this The second disc is the other side. They put on the uh, <laughs> second disc. Yeah, yeah but... Not great films, either of them. I think two is a little more tolerable than three, but uh, I remember two just two has a the... couple of good scenes in it because of that yeah. uh, guy. Well, uh, yeah, and I think I think actually one of the extras on Poltergeist Two is they interview the worm uh, from the tequila <laughs> bottle. Yeah, I remember the Leonard Maltin review of Poltergeist Two. In his review, he said, uh, "Be forewarned that an actor does receive credit for the vomit creature." <laughs> Yes. You know, yeah. and the the creature that Craig T. Nielsen vomits up, but anyway. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh oh, Bob Balaban's <laughs> Bob Balaban's director <laughs> the, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say uh, Bob Balaban's directorial debut, Parents, from nineteen eighty nine. I think that has uh Randy Quaid in it and uh And Mary Beth Hurt. Mary Beth Hurt, that's right. Uh yes, yeah, so that's that's kind of an interesting film and pretty dark. <laughs> if, yeah, uh, if, what I recall, it's got a cult but, following. Yeah, definitely it does. got a cult following. Uh, That's uh, of, one of those one of those that Lionsgate has been issuing the old Vestron video titles, and that's one of those. Uh, as is Lair of the White Worm, Ken mm, Russell uh, from 1988. Yeah. So, anyway. So there, there you go with the uh, the a couple of four eighties or four or five eighties films there. Uh, there, uh, Shout Factory did the complete Billy Jack box set, which has all four Billy Jack films um, and remastered in high def <laughs> for all you clamoring for all the Billy Jack that you can get. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and of course, lots of extras on there too. And uh, we have a couple more Twilight Time titles. Uh, Mad Magician with Vincent Price is presented in 3D on the disc, and the bonus feature may be of interest to some people. They actually have the two uh, Three Stooges shorts from the 50s, the ones with Shemp that were filmed in 3D. They're actually presented as bonuses on here in 3D. So you can actually see the two Three Stooges shorts that were shot in the in, uh, three-dimensionally. Uh, I remember I one of them was called Spooks. That's right, it's on here. <laughs> yep. So uh anyway, uh Comes a Horseman for, is also Twilight Time that um Alan Pecula, of course, 1978, James Caan and Jane Fonda and Jason Roberts. Have you tried and, um, to sit through it? Did. I did. I did. I did and it You it, know what? It's, it's a movie going. that you think 
oh man, this is going to be so good. It's got a good cast. You know, right. You know, for, for Richard Farnsworth nominated for an Oscar for it. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gordon Willis doing the photography. Oh, it's prob- beautiful prob- photography, by the way. Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, boy, what a bore. Yeah, it never really comes to together. Say, it's uh, it just does not work. Uh, it's a real shame too because they really had uh, good crew there. But yeah, yeah. Who uh, so, who uh, directed uh, who directed the Electric Horseman? Is that Sidney Pollack or? Yeah, yeah, that's Sidney Pollack. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So anyway, yeah. But uh, Ali, the uh, speaking of Michael Mann. The uh, uh, with uh, Will Smith that's been issued by Sony and uh, uh, here's one that I wanted to throw out there uh, Death Race 2050 Roger Corman actually produced this and it's a uh, follow up to uh, belated follow up to Death Race 2000 from 1975 and I had my doubts about this one but I gotta tell you I thought it was very enjoyable on the same it was, level as the original <laughs> yes, talked, it was I talked about it last week on last week's show and yeah, it, it's, I, it's, it, it, I was surprised. I was me surprised. too. And me too. Very, very satirical, and I laughed quite a few times. So uh, for people who think it's just a cheap cash grab, it's actually, it has some, some pretty good stuff in there. Uh, boy, did I get a wrong number with uh, Bob Hope <laughs> from 1966. And I again, the Leonard Malton review always said, uh, "Boy, did I get a wrong number." They sure did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right after the word but, uh, "bomb," you know. <laughs> yeah, it's not as bad as some of his other ones from the late '60s, early '70s, like "Cancel My Reservation." There's some, you know, there's a couple of decently funny sequences in it, but it's still not a great film for sure. Uh, but the man who fell to earth. Um, with, um, of course, David Bowie. It's a three-disc special edition. Lionsgate put that out. So, uh, anyway, there there you go. And um, and then we're moving into February. Uh, we'll go ahead and get those knocked out right quick. How about a 30th anniversary of Dirty Dancing? <laughs> 30 years. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. 30 years of having to suffer through people loving that movie. <laughs> yeah, the film I, that I, never I, dies. I mean, do, do you guys share my antipathy towards that movie? Because uh, yes, I just, yes. <laughs> I just, I really don't understand why that movie is set in the '60s since they make no effort to. No, no, no effort to make it. it look like it's set in the '60s at all. I ignored it when it came out. I'll be honest. I just paid it no attention. I ignored it for years. I ignored it, and finally, I just I had to give in and see what the brouhaha was about. But for, for why a did long you have time, to get in? Give in? Were you? I just it's such a pop culture. Were you watching it with thing. one of, with your daughter or something like? That? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. My kids were they were curious, and and I you know, and and of course, there's so many pop cultural references to it, but. And I thought, yeah, I guess I should finally watch it, and I did. And it's it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's not a great movie for sure. No. Um, and it's a uh, Man anyway. Dookie movie, isn't it? <laughs> did oh, Luis uh, Man Dookie direct it? Emil Ardolino, the guy who uh, did Sister Act, God. and um, yeah, he Ooh, died. The director's you know. all wrong today. <laughs> <laughs> well, <that's, laughs> Good job, no, guy, you know, baby. He, well, <laughs> I mean, it 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 feels like a Manduki. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Man it Dookie. does. Yeah, and, and it plays it has, like a Manduki as well. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. He did like three uh, the sequel to Three Men and a Baby, uh, Three Men and a Little Lady, or whatever. And then he did uh, Sister Act, and then he died. So he had like three movies to his credit, I think. But well, he was an Oscar winner too. He, he, you know, I think he, he should have done. I think he should have done the third thing you mentioned before the first two. I think he should have died <laughs> and then directed Sister Act <laughs> and three bits of the movie. I think he was an yeah, Oscar he, winner, if I'm not mistaken. For, for a documentary, uh, he did a documentary film. called uh, Ballet Documentary, I think. Yeah, it's. Uh, um, Oh God, I can't remember, but it's got a really good title. 
Um, it, yeah, I can't remember the title, but it, that's what got him the gig for. I love the days. way he dances, or something like that, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, and he got he got noticed for that, and that's what led to his uh, getting the job for the gig for Dirty Dancing. Yeah, that's right. But uh, yeah, so Twilight Time titles for February uh, included Edge of Eternity, directed by Don Siegel and starring Cornell Wilde. I have to admit I haven't seen this one yet, but um, yeah. I'm I, I, looking forward to it. Kiss of Death, of course, the classic film noir mm. uh, with Richard Widmark. It's the one that features you know him pushing the uh, the, the the woman down the hill uh, in a wheelchair or did yeah. she over a cliff or I can't remember. But it's down anyway. some stairs or something. I think down some stairs. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, they also released uh, Interiors, the Woody Allen film from '78, his follow up to Annie Hall, which I think is a great, great film that still uh, carries quite, quite a packs quite a wallop. Still. I think it does. And yeah, I think, uh, you know, if you think about, you know, he got raked over the coals for uh, imitating Bergman. But who out there even tries to imitate Bergman? That's true. That's I mean, true. And I, I thought... was trying to think of somebody who does, and I can't think of anybody except for yeah. for uh, Woody Allen. So I wish I... there were more Bergman Im- imitations. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I mean, it has some Bergman-esque touches, but it, it is also a, a uniquely Woody Allen movie too. When you look at it in, in, in some ways, I see his unique touches. So, I mean, yeah, there's some Bergman influences, but it's it's definitely a Woody Allen movie. Um, I think the most <clears throat> Bergman, uh, the most Bergman-esque thing about it, besides you know certain shots, certainly the closing mm-hmm. shot is very much so. Oh but, yeah, um, yeah, definitely. <clears throat> You know, they've got shots of people, you know, touching windows and stuff like that. But right, I think the most Bergman-esque quality to it is that it has no music, which is That's probably true. the only Woody Allen movie that, I mean, it has music in one scene. Mm. Uh, but uh, 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 other than that, it's probably the only Woody Allen movie that doesn't have any music on That's it true. at all. That's um, a good point. Yeah, uh, you know, over the closing or opening credits, mm-hmm. no music. Uh, so, uh, very. Uh, but I, I think it's a great, great movie. Uh, and uh, I do too. Uh, it still, it still really gets to me. I, I mean, mm-hmm. particularly when you get to the last third of it. But I mean, it, it's really just uh, peppered with just devastating scenes and and a it really, is. really great yeah. cast. And also, beautiful again, beautiful. Gordon Willis photography and that art direction, uh, that sort of minimalist art direction, is uh, is fantastic. I just love yeah, it. Yeah, it is. And that was the same year as Comes a Horseman that we were just talking about. And the Gordon Willis did both of those in the same year, which is interesting to note. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but uh, so another Twilight Time release that I know we're fans of. I'm pretty sure. Chilly Scenes of Winter. Mm. Uh, so they've done that as well. And um, what's on that now? Like, uh, I mean, did you get a copy of it or? Haven't they're having a delay with their Twilight Time shipment for the review copies? We haven't. Uh, all my colleagues are having the same problem, so I think there may be a manufacturing error on some of that. We've they've had that problem before, but they you know they mm. they do get them. But uh, but I do know that there is a uh, a um, a commentary by Joan Micklin Silver. Uh, wow! Yeah, so so she, there's a there is a commentary that she does, and there may be a feature, uh, uh, like a short featurette or something. But there are some extras. So if you're mm. a fan, and it's a new and it's an upgraded uh, transfer, I believe. So if you're a fan, you might want to upgrade for the uh, the Twilight Time release of Chilly Scenes of Winter, which I'm I'm with you. I think it's a great film, and. Um, they, uh, you know, I'm glad they put it out there. Uh, I'm really yeah. Really glad. It was about time for it to happen. Uh, I, I, I'm just hoping that they put out uh, a co- you know, the copy of the uh, of the alternate ending. You know, the the original ending. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I don't think so it's I, on here, unfortunately. I just, I don't understand that really. But um, yeah. I guess maybe because I, I, I no, it's the same, it's the same studio. So I, I, I don't get it, but. Uh, I I just uh, reprinted uh, uh, my 
But the first movie that I chose to review on filmic ability was Chili Seeds of Winter because at that time mm-hmm. it wasn't even available on right. uh, DVD. Uh, and uh, uh, a, a few years later it finally came out on DVD. So, But uh, I, uh, I took my original uh, review and reprinted it on Zeke film and and repolished it up and everything. So, yeah. Uh, if you want to read my commentary about uh, Chili Saints of Winter, go on to zekefilm dot org. That's Z E K E F I L M. It's run out, run by a great group of people out of uh, St. Louis, and uh, it can really use some hits. They they really they need. They, I write for them and everything, but they really need some people to come in. And read some of this stuff. So, mm-hmm. but uh, but anyway, uh, check out that review on Zeke Film. Yeah. Good. Well, uh, moving along, there's a Tree of Wooden Clogs is a Criterion release. Uh, the three hour and seven minute 1978 Palme d'Or winner, Cannes Film mm. Festival of the Italians. Uh, deals with four different families on an Italian farm in the. 1899, I think it is. I, mm-hmm. I finally, I did catch up to that one. I'd never seen it before, and it's, uh, you know, it's it, it, the pacing is, you know, it takes its time, but it, it, it does. Power, it does very powerful ending though. The ending kind of makes the whole experience, in my opinion, with the the shot of the family. That's well, you know, I don't want to say too much, but uh, yeah, it's just powerful. It is. It's good. it's a very good movie. I don't think yeah. it's quite quite as good as some people think it is, but uh, I agree. But it's, it's I agree. very very good. Yeah, but a, the other Criterion's we'll go through these very quickly. Mildred Pierce is another Criterion release. Uh, Women on the Birds of Nervous Breakdown and uh, the Before Trilogy, which I'm very excited. This comes out Tuesday. Haven't gotten a copy yet. Uh, hoping too soon, but this is uh, all three of Richard Linklater's before films, before uh, Sunrise, Sunset, and before Midnight, and lots of new extras that have been contributed here, new transfers. Uh, It was about time they did a high-def upgrade on these, and so really, really excited. You think they'll? Uh, you think that um, that Linkletter and and Hawk and Delphi will go back to that well again and do Before Noon? <laughs> I wish they would. I really wish they would. I don't know. They said they haven't. You know, they always say, "Well, we might, we might not, we don't know." You know, they're kind of coy about it. But uh, uh-huh. I think they might. I mean, there's. I think there's enough interest from people who have followed these characters over the the decades and I think we'd like to see where they wind up. I mean, I'm I'm curious. I know that. <laughs> I think it just makes sense that if you're going to do before midnight, yeah. you got to do before noon. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Okay. I that's it. I think that's a good idea, but anyway, so there's your criterion and uh we have um, a couple of Warner Archives releases here, Love in the Afternoon, which I mentioned earlier, directed by Billy Wilder um, and uh, Audrey Hepburn yet again, and uh, just Maurice Valier and Gary Cooper, and a lot of people kind of give that movie a hard time because they say the age difference between Gary Cooper and Audrey Hepburn is so great, but it's... It uh, is. <laughs> it, it, it is. Yeah, it really is. It is. But if you just forget about that and go with the film, I mean, it 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 has its pleasures. So, yeah. uh Anyway, so the Yakuza with Robert Mitchum, Sidney Pollock, um, from '75, of course, written by the Schrader brothers, Paul and Leonard, and uh, that at the time was the highest amount ever paid for a screenplay uh, when they sold that script. Huh. And so, yeah, it was. I think. You um, recall what the number was that they? Got I'm paid? thinking it was about three hundred thousand, something like that. Wow. So it was a yeah, it was a pretty substantial amount. But uh anyway, so directed by Sidney Pollack and it's interesting to see Robert Mitchum pushing 60 as an action star in the mid 70s. So Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Man, uh, you, if you think about the 70s and like the way they had older stars, you know, still doing action and 
and yeah. you know, you know, their names were above the titles and everything. It, I, it's, yeah, it's, t- it's totally different now. <laughs> it's true. It's very true. Yeah. But uh, another Warner Archive release is, speaking of Ken Russell earlier, we talked about Larry the White Worm, uh, The Boyfriend from 1971, uh, with Twiggy, of course. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Adaptation of the the musical uh, that had Julie Andrews. Let me say, you know, I just watched a Ken Russell movie, um, Mm -hmm. rewatched it, because I remember watching it when it first came out. Horror? Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Roger Ebert gave it a rave review, I think. <laughs> uh, and it is god awful, isn't? It? Is it just me? Or is that movie like really awful? I hated it. <laughs> I really think that there's just something about Kim Russell that kind of dies when the '80s come around. Yeah, like, I kind of agree. Yeah, you don't, you don't you agree? There's like, yeah. I mean, he might have some flashes of interesting stuff, like in the '80s and '90s, but generally, like once the '70s leave, Ken Russell is yeah. over. Uh, and here's, uh, yeah, here's another question: uh, Is Teresa Russell a good actress, or as is she is she not a good actress, and she's had the benefit of being in one or two good movies where she was passable? No, she's she's a good actress. I mean, you know, uh, you know, with things like, you know, insignificant timing. Uh, yeah, bad timing. You know, the things with Nicholas Rogue, and uh, and yeah. also, who, I, I think she was married to Nicholas Rogue, if I'm, if I'm not she mistaken. Was, but she was. You're right. Um, uh, but uh, but also things like uh, Black Widow. And yeah, uh, and of one. course, Straight Time. Uh, and mm-hmm. I'm probably missing a few, but. She was good, uh, but uh, every once in a while she could do something where she was really stiff for some reason. And she's uh, really she's really awful in in uh, horror, and it's almost I almost feel like she was directed to to be to play it very amateurish. Mm. Like it it really is something you'd see on like co- community theater stage by someone that <laughs> had ambitions to be an actor and knew they weren't. Uh-huh. But, uh, and I thought I thought she was passable in um, yeah Black Widow, uh, but uh, the one where she is it is it bad timing or it's insignificance where she plays like the off of Marilyn Monroe, right? Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I I think she's really good in that movie, but uh, but anyway, back to Kim Russell. Uh, you know the the boyfriend is a great example of of Kim Russell's you know kind of almost psychedelic style right back then yep. you know like uh you know i think i think the boyfriend and and tommy and i guess uh to a certain extent the devils so i think there's a little bit more of a classicist quality in the devils but the the musicals that he's done and i've never seen you know things like uh the like uh the music lovers uh, uh, yeah, the music lovers and, I and love what, 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 I love what was that. the savage uh, savage messiah? The savage messiah and and, uh, and even lives to mania, which I've only seen clips of, but that just looks mm-hmm. insane. Uh, but um, yeah, the the boyfriend is a really good example. I mean, you might not like it because you <clears throat> it's kind of a I mean, as far, as far as musicals go, let's face it; it's one of the one of the gayest musicals out there. It's just so <laughs> yeah. it's it's just so it just oozes homosexuality that that uh, the movie. But uh, but the the look of it is really interesting. I, I'm not so interested in the music, but just the the visuals of it are amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it it definitely has its uh, yeah it's it, yeah he's definitely uh, his stylishness comes through that's for sure. Yeah. And, uh, hey I, Adam. I just, I, yeah. Speaking, this is mm-hmm. a different topic. <clears throat> Speaking of music, um, there's a movie that uh, I never hear anyone talk about, and I don't think it's available on any platform. It's that movie, uh, The Music of Chance. Do you remember that movie? 
I do remember that. Yeah, that's the one that uh, uh, it's based James on a Paul Spader, Oscar novel. Man, Mandy, Mandy Patinkin and M. Emmett Walsh. Right. Where they got to they got to build a brick wall or something to right to to pay off a poker game or it's an That's odd right. odd movie and I never I I've, I've never seen it mentioned I don't know that it's available anywhere is it I don't think it is I don't think it is yeah I I'm a big fan of Paul Auster the uh, the novelist I I've read yeah. most of his novels he's really good and uh, that was. Yeah, that's typical of his stuff. And yeah, I never saw it. I never saw it, and I don't believe it's been issued to my knowledge, which I thought was you unlike should, you. I always thought that was odd. You, you should find it. It's quite, it's quite a movie. Like it's a real oddball kind of discovery of a movie. Uh-huh. I'd, I'd be curious to see how closely it follows the novel because I did read the novel. I did. It's been it's been a while, probably a good seven eight years. Interesting cast. Uh, Charles Durning, Joel Gray, Chris mm-hmm. Penn, Samantha Mathis. Yeah. Now, he actually tried to direct his own movie, you know, uh, Paul Auster. He he directed Lulu on the Train, which I thought was pretty good uh, myself. And didn't he co-direct uh, Smoke? or Smoke, he? yes, he did. But, yeah, he got the solo directing smoke. credit. For I love Smoke. Lulu. Yeah. It's good. But I thought Lulu... Lulu on the Train was the was a cinematic approximation of what he does as a novelist. It was a very close. You could tell that it was very you know, that that he was the guy behind it. If you've read any of his novels, there was no doubt. Mm. So uh, yeah, it's it's I, I liked it. I dug it, but it may be because I uh, read so many of his books. Who, who wrote the Sheltering Sky? Sheltering Sky. Oh, uh, uh, that was. Um... Because he's in the actual movie, the author. Um, I'm drawing a blank on that. I can't remember now. It's somebody, Paul, it's somebody Paul like Bowles. that. Though. The names. Yeah. Paul. Okay. It's because it's one of those books that they said was unadaptable, and he actually kind of narrates the opening of it in the actual film. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, for some reason, I thought it was. The author that you mentioned, Paul Astor, I saw, it reminded me of him, but it's... It was the Paul. Yeah. The two Pauls. Yeah. The two Pauls. Yeah, Breakfast yep. at Tiffany's, <laughs> Wait Until Dark. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, it's all good in the end. Uh, but no, um, so how about... Kino has issued One Million Years B.C., the uh, the one with Raquel Welch, and they the big news here is it's a 4K restoration, and they have a the U.K. cut of the film, which is nine minutes longer. Mm. So, Ugh. and both of them have been issued uh, with uh, new 4K restorations. So, I, you know, I hear the the transfers are good. I've heard, but as far as the quality of the film, it is what it is. You know, I just so, could uh, not watch it. I, I started it and I just couldn't finish it. I, uh, you know, <laughs> even with Raquel Welch, I just couldn't do it. <laughs> well, how about yeah, the, uh, the con- caveman oh, movies ahead. are hard to stick with. Yeah, they it's really are. Harry you know, Elton. you have yeah. to. You know, you really have to like sit there and be invested in just I don't know. And but I mean, at least uh, one million BC has that. You know, Jim Danforth special yep. effects, right? So, uh, so that's good. That's something. Yeah. At least. The only caveman movie I would have had any interest in seeing. It's Phil Hartman's Caveman Lawyer. That's like the only kind of... If he made a movie out of that when he was alive, that would have been awesome. <laughs> Quest for Fire was great. a good caveman movie. Uh, yeah. No? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> I, would, I would choose Quest for Fire as the greatest caveman movie yeah. ever made. My, uh... One of, one of my friends was on a movie a trivia show for Cinemax because they... They were they were producing a movie trivia show to play in between you know during their previews uh, in between movies and uh, he was a contestant on it and he lost uh, based on a movie about Quest for Fire. The question uh, uh, was, uh, really? Uh, yeah, Ray Dong Chong masturbated. Was. Yeah, I'm telling you, the question was Ray Dong Chong masturbated in what what movie? Wow. <laughs> Mm. I guess they were co- sort of going for that kind of remote control type uh, 
You remember that MTV yeah. show, Remote yep, Control? Yep, 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 yep. Sort of mm-hmm. uh, irreverent questions. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, there's a couple of, speaking of one million years B.C. and the giant monsters and all that, there's a couple other ones that are worth mentioning, I guess. When Dinosaurs Ruled the Earth, that's a Warner Archive release. And uh, the 2005 King Kong has been reissued by Universal in the Ultimate Edition, which includes all the uh, the, the production diaries that were le- released on a separate disc uh, originally. And so they, now they've put them all on the same in the same package. And this has the director's cut, the theatrical cut, and all the the goodies that were on the other one. So it's all in one place now. So if you're a fan of the Peter Jackson's Kong from 2005, well, you got one destination to get it all. So okay. You know. And uh, Leonard Cohen, I'm Your Man, the uh, musical concert film from uh, 2006, has been issued by Sony on Blu-ray, and I think that's quite quite a quite a good concert film myself. I enjoyed it, and I, you know it's a little. Is it black uh, and white? It's a really good. It's a re- the, no. It's, it's a color. Uh, there's, yeah. There's, yeah, but it's a really black and white. It is a really good concert film. And it, and it has a good uh, interview with uh, Leonard Cohen where he talks about particular yep. songs. But there is one mm-hmm. jaw-dropping performance of, of "If It Be Your Will" by Anthony, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. who's who's nominated for an Oscar a few years ago, and I think he was disinvited. He did that "Chasing Ice" song, I think. Um, oh yeah, but, yeah. Uh, it it is such a great performance of that song, and I I'd never seen him before, and I said, "Who the hell is this guy?" Because he he's very like Joe Cocker esque when he sings it to the microphone, he, he kind of convulses the song. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he and at, at the same time he has this very high pitched, almost angelic voice. Uh, it's beautiful. So I rec- recommend watching that movie just for that one performance. I think overall it's a good movie. I, I, I as far as concert movies go, I, I I do I do like it quite a bit. Um, so we've got Phil Carlson's final film as a director. This is the guy who made so many of those crime-type films, Walking Tall, Phoenix uh, City Story, uh, Framed from 1975 mm. with uh, Joe Don Baker. So Kino has... You were just talking about that. that one. <laughs> well, yeah, framed. I, I got a copy to review for a seat film, and uh, oh, yeah, okay. I, watched it, I watched it the other night. And uh, Have you seen it? Uh, I, didn't get, I didn't get one. Uh, oh, okay. I requested it, but didn't, they said they were out. So uh, you know, it's so kind of a, I mean, it's basically kind of a <laughs> kind of a remake of Walking Tall. It's just it's just basically people fucking Joe Don Baker over and him coming back to go and get after him. That's all that, that that's all there yeah, is to it. I mean, they even genre. they even beat him up and he's in the hospital and he's got yeah. bandages and stuff. So it's just like Walking <laughs> Tall in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, sounds like fun. It, it, it's you know a Joe Don Baker movie is twice as much fun as it used to be after watching, uh, but but you have to have watched that MST three thousand MSTK three thousand oh, version yeah, yeah. of of Mitchell before you really <laughs> before you really get into the whole uh, the whole thing of how. Well, I mean, Joe Don Baker was kind of gross. He was gr- <laughs> What's he doing as a lead? Like, it's just he's he's fat and sweaty, and he's he's kind of yeah, he's right. a jerk all the time, and he's smoking those little cigars that make you want to punch somebody in the face, and and just <laughs> uh, you know his his hair looks greasy. He's, he's he's wearing you know every shade of brown imaginable. You know, like he's just <laughs> he's the, he's the worst. He's just how is he a yeah. star? And uh, and you can only chalk it up to uh, um, to uh, to walking tall, really, and because um, uh, that really did make him for a brief moment a a huge star. Um, but uh, framed framed has some good things in it, you know. It's uh, you know it's kind of fun. It's a beer drinking movie. It's you yeah. know you're sitting there drinking beers and making kind of making fun of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, Phil Carlson was a good director. Uh, he sure was, the, yeah. In the 50s and 60s, maybe not so much in the 70s, so. Yeah, yeah. 
I, I, his movies are, you know, those seventies ones are very simplistically done, but I, I don't know. I have a soft spot for them. I enjoy them. I have to admit they're I, indefensible, I, but, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I have a soft spot for them only because they remind me of going to the drive-in as a kid. But yeah. other than that, other than that, it's there's no. Um, I mean, they're they're not really good movies. Uh, <laughs> it's like kind of like Walking Tall. It's it's shamelessly manipulative, and uh, you know, it's just cliched and all this. But I still enjoy it. I, I it's, it's, Connie <laughs> Van Dyke. Connie Van Dyke is in this one, and she plays his, his girlfriend, obviously, and yeah. uh, and she has two terrible songs to sing in it, yeah. and because um, she's kind of a quasi country star, mm-hmm. where she was, and uh, there's a really awful rape scene in it. That's just whoa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's just, uh, I mean. It's not quite as graphic as it could be, you know. It's not like the rape in The Sopranos, for instance. But uh, it it's still just it, it amazes mm. me how how every how many movies in the seventies had rape scenes in them. It's astounding. Yeah, they, they, they were place. they were very rapey. Why don't, you do, why don't you do a list, Dean, of the ten best rape scenes from the seventies? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that won't I be think that'd be an easy list. list to do. I mean, you know, yeah. straw dogs yeah. have to be in there, of course. Yep. So yeah, there's a uh, last you know. house on the left. Last house on the left. Runs on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. maybe yep. Clockwork Orange. Yep, yeah. yep. There you go. Yeah, that so. would be an easy list. You're right. So <laughs> good, good uh, rapes, one and all. Yeah. <laughs> Beauty and the Beast, the 2014 version with Vincent Cassel. No, that would, that would not be on the list, Adam. Beauty and the Beast <laughs> no. would not be on the rape list. <laughs> no, I don't think so. You're right. But this is the one from just a couple of years ago. I, I haven't seen it, but uh, it's uh, Shout Factory put that one out. Uh, so they did a live-action version a few years ago? So Yeah, Vincent Cassell was in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my God. How many times are they going to have film this thing? So now they got the live action version of the cartoon coming up. Yeah, this yeah. is this one was French actually from a couple of years ago. So okay, um, I still think so, it's a story that's been told too many times. But yeah, right. I think I think I think uh, you know that '40s version uh, uh, is is the best out of all of them. Yeah, this is the Cocteau. Uh, I think you're right about the Cocteau. Cocteau. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a couple of horror films here. Dead Time Stories, which is one of those anthology films. And I saw it when it came out. I thought it was kind of weak. This was an 80s film as well. And don't remember yeah. being overly impressed with this one. And uh, Psychomania from 1971. And uh, then we have, um, uh, speaking of 80s films, here's one for you. How about King Solomon's Minds with Richard Chamberlain? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got that Speaking of the, the canon other day. films. Yeah. yeah. And that's uh, a canon, like, right? Uh, uh, yep, yep. It's a canon. And then they did Alan Quartermain and the Lost City of Gold. That's right. It. Uh, yep. it was yep. it was the yep. post the post Raiders you know, the post Raiders movies. Mm-hmm. You know, just like Jake Speed and all that kind of stuff. Yep. It's true. So I got two more titles and uh, this will be it for February. I have uh, What a Way to Go, directed by Jay Lee Thompson. From, <laughs> you should you should uh, save that for last. <laughs> oh uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> there you go. I didn't think about that. Well, the last one here is No Retreat, No Surrender. <laughs> <laughs> that that's good too. <laughs> yeah. So that that's that's your February and uh, highlights of January. That kind of brings us up to date with the uh, the Blu-ray okay. releases. <laughs>